Today we're going to be talking about T-Wings on F1 cars in 2017. Now I've seen quite a few different explanations of T-Wings out and about on the internet and a lot of the ones I see are kind of quite off. Uh, so today I'm going to be going through with some CFD results to go through do some myth busting and some proper explanations on what they're actually doing out there. So our geometry for today is just the 2017 parent F1 car uh, as I used in my previous shark fin videos and then on the back I've just put on a little T-wing of my own design it's kind of similar to the Williams one and it's going to basically be tested with and without the T-wing and we'll see the difference. Now why do the T-wings exist? Well Craig Scarborough has actually done a nice little graphic for me of all the different exclusion zones on Formula One car. So we can see here that on the 2017 cars there's no exclusion zone where the T-wings can go. So teams are obviously putting stuff there because they feel there's a benefit and today we're going to see what that benefit is. Now what's interesting is that this exclusion zone actually goes up and down for quite a bit. So I'd say as the season progresses we're probably going to see more and more teams adapting and using different sections of that zone. In terms of what I originally thought the T-wing did, well my first thought was that it's just going to be a straightforward downforce producing element. A lot of people were talking about conditioning the flow to the rear wing and that really doesn't make a huge amount of sense when you consider how high the T-wing is and how far it is above the rear wing. Conditioning basically requires that you produce a flow structure that travels downstream and hits a downstream object and that changes the flow around that. So if you can't get the flow to impact, it's not conditioning the flow. I thought there would be a bit of an interaction in the pressure fields between the underside of the T-wing and the top of the rear wing as well as a little bit of an upwash interaction but primarily I thought the T-wing was going to be a high aspect ratio so long and relatively thin element, high efficiency, basically free downforce. So let's have a look at the CFD numbers and see what we sort of found. Now in terms of what we got on the total car we gained 1.8 to 1.9 points of downforce across the whole car. Now what's a point? For those of you who's not familiar with the unit, uh, basically we have a coefficient of lift across the car and a point is one hundredth of a coefficient of lift. So if our coefficient of lift was negative one before and we make it negative 1.01, .01, we've added one point of downforce. So we gained 1.8 to 1.9 points of downforce across the car. We also put on 1.4 points of drag with the T-wing as well. So Lift to drag went up slightly but we did actually gain drag across the whole car. The rear wing, this is the interesting one, the rear wing didn't actually produce a significantly different amount of downforce. It was pretty much the same for both scenarios. Now I thought that the low pressure field on the underside of the T-wing would cause that rear wing to be producing less downforce because of the interaction with the top surface of the T-wing. But it was pretty much the same. So we'll have to look at the CFD results a bit later so I can show you why that is. The rear wing coefficient of drag however did go up quite a bit. We gained almost a point of drag on the rear wing. Now the T-wing itself, uh, as per my speculation, it put on a bit over three points of downforce at a lift to drag ratio of just under 13 to 1. So very efficient element, uh, much more efficient than the actual car which is more in the region sort of 3 or 4 to 1. So we can see that the T-wing itself is almost free downforce. But let's have a look at how it behaves around the rest of the car. So as I said originally, my first thought was is that the T-wing couldn't be conditioning flow because it's too high. And we put streamlines through the center of the T-wing, we can see that yes, the flow is in fact nowhere near the rear wing. But perhaps what I did not think about was the effects of the rear wing vortex and what that would cause in terms of the T-wing vortex displacement. So if we put streamlines around the outside edge of the T-wing, we can see they actually get pulled down around to where the rear wing vortex kind of is forming. So that's going to do two things. One, the vortex off the T-wing itself is a low pressure region. So we're going to get increased low pressure there. It's also swirling in the same direction so we can enhance that rear wing vortex. So that leads to some interesting things. We've shifted this vortex down here, we've got more low pressure on the outside of the rear wing. What does that mean? It means our rear wing out particularly our second element now will function with more low pressure on it because we've made it so that it's kind of almost sucking the air out. Now these are of course quite small gains because the vortices off the T-wing aren't huge but it's something that happens. If we look at the underside of the rear wing we can see and this is a really small amount here because we were not talking huge differences. 
we can see a very slight difference in the pressure field between the two cases. So with the T-Wing case on, there's ever so slightly more low pressure there. You can just see where that blue line goes a little bit further than on the case without the T-Wing. But across the entire element, we're going to see that pressure differential on the rear wing. Now specifically, we're getting the second element to perform better. Now this means that we're going to end up with a increased drag because the second element is angled further backwards. If we look, the second element is almost at sort of 45 degree angle. So you imagine 45 degree angle, you apply a low pressure here. Pressure can only act tangentially to the surface. It pulls the surface down, but it also pulls it back. So that's why we're getting an increased drag on the rear wing. Now, why is our downforce staying the same then if our second element downforce has increased? If we look at the pressure fields around the T-wing, we can see that the T-wing's low pressure region is starting to interact with the high pressure region on the top of the main plane. This means that this region is going to see a very so slightly reduced pressure on top of it. And also we're going to see a little bit of upwash from the T-wing itself that will cause the rear wing to be making slightly less downforce. So the effects of the end vortex improvement is going to be causing more downforce on the back end and this is going to cause less downforce on the front end which is why we've seen the change in lift to drag. Now one of the main things that I should note here is that I did not adjust the geometry for the new flow effects of my T-wings. Actual Formula 1 teams would adjust these geometries to compensate for all these effects and of course with the T-wing providing that low pressure field, it also means that it's providing some form of aerodynamic support for the rear wing. So you could theoretically drive the rear wing that little bit harder and get a little bit more performance there. So what are the three main takeaways from today's experiment? One, the T-wing itself is a very efficient high downforce element. That's pretty much free downforce if you can get away with it. Two, the T-wing, while it doesn't condition air for the rear wing as such, it does affect the interactions around the rear wing outboard end plate, which can then result in potentially improved rear wing performance. But that may be the expense of total drag. Three is that the low pressure field and the upwash of the T-wing will interact with the rear wing, meaning you'll have to adjust that geometry accordingly. From this, we can kind of see why some of the teams have chosen the different routes they have. Different teams like Mercedes running double T-wings will reduce the strength of that vortex so they can gain the advantage of the high efficiency T-wing downforce without having that vortex effect being as prominent on the rear wing. Other teams that aren't running a T-wing at all, for example, may not be trying to get that lower pressure region on the rear wing. So we can see how we're ending up with a whole bunch of different solutions rather than just everyone running exactly the same T-wing design. And also, I wouldn't be surprised if more teams started to use up more of this box, like well, some of them kind of have started on it, but I wouldn't imagine if it increases as the season progresses. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Make sure you leave a comment about what you'd like to see next in a video. And hopefully, I'll see you next time.